thank you for coming. I know it's a really busy time of year. It's pretty crazy, so I appreciate your presence. Um, I'm Eleanor Lee Pat Chesler, a research coordinator in the in uh, the Office of Research, Partnership, and Globalization. And this is our lecture series, and we will have two more this season for which we have flyers on the back. And um, I'd like to introduce our um, own professor, Dr. Robert Rueda, who's going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I know there's several things went on today, so we probably would have had a, a larger turnout. All the PhD students are, are on campus visiting, and there's several other things going on. But, um, I was glad that we were able to bring Brian here. Uh, I first met Brian when he was a uh, doctoral student at Arizona State University working with Gene Garcia, and they had a huge uh, preschool project, uh, which was really interesting work. But I started conversing with him because he had all these questions about stuff I've been dealing with in one way or another for probably my whole career. You know, how do you reconcile all the uh, socio-cultural factors, culture, context, and all those things with some of the more cognitively oriented uh, learning sciences and cognitive research. And so we've continued that conversation. Um, we've been working jointly on, uh, we have an IES grant in right now that we still haven't heard about. Um, but uh, looking at early literacy with um, some of the farm worker families in Central California. Um, so Brian is involved in all kinds of interesting activities. He uh, is currently at uh, Brigham Young University. He was uh, at Bard right before that. He's, uh, Adam is there currently. Uh, it's a really interesting little campus if you've never been there, uh, right in the middle of where all the action used to be. So um, I'm not going to take too much more of their time. Uh, he's been doing a really interesting line of work that's looking at uh, the achievement of uh, Latino and Mexican American kids. And he's been promoting a, sort of a binational approach, which goes, you know, moving beyond our borders to think about uh, how these are really binational issues. And so you can't really address it just by having American scholars talk to themselves about stuff that's going on in other places. So he's really. Uh, his recent book uh, by Teachers College Press brings a variety of authors to bear on um, some of the questions, so I'll uh, talk about that. Yeah. So Adam and I are going to do a dance for you uh, for the next hour or so. We're going to sort of transition tag team. Um, so this, this, this book really represents the efforts of multiple, um, not only authors, and collaborations across disciplines um, and across uh, not only disciplinary borders but actual borders. Uh, we have authors uh, uh, working and from Mexico. But also um, uh, came out of a conference that some of you were there, uh, Roberto Soro uh, <laughs> presented there, um, a conference that we had in 2010 in Mexico City um, called Los Estudiantes que Compartimos, or Students We Share, um, thinking about what does it mean to improve school quality for children who are transnational, for children who have family and school experiences on both sides of the border. Not only in border regions in northern Mexico and the southwest, but across our country because uh, transnationalism is a, is a matter of fact, is a fact um, in, in various regions within the two countries. And so we brought migration scholars, we had funding fr um, from the Civil Rights Project at UCLA, we brought, edu brought education researchers, uh, demographers, graduate students, and there were even some journalists who showed up. Uh, and uh, sort of, we, there were about 300 of us, and we had a, a, a day conference and uh, discussed these issues and what it meant for future scholarship and, and policy in general. And so Patricia Gandra, who really spearheaded the effort along with Eugene Garcia, really pushed us afterward. You need to produce a, something from this. And so this represents the product, really, of, of multiple colleagues. And so here are the authors um, of the volume. Several folks have collaborated um, uh, from Mexico and from the US um, addressing several dimensions of the, of the question. How do we improve the quality of school ex schooling experiences for Mexican origin children on both sides of the border? And so the, this volume really has uh, five parts. Um, in the first part, we identify uh, challenges and dilemmas, uh, specifically the attainment gaps that we still see for even third generation Mexican origin students in the United States. Achievement gaps as well, we uh, drew on um, 
uh, nationally representative study in the United States uh, looking at the achievement differences of Mexican Americans and uh, uh, Hispanic non-white students and we see uh, persistent gaps even by the third generation and so there was a whole section or part uh, that really focused on what are the, the, the actual dilemmas and how do we uh, understand them from different perspectives. And then we deal with some of the policy and practice problems currently in Mexico and we'll share some information on that. Mexico has engaged in rapid school expansion. Um, it's the only country that I know of that has schooling compulsory now for children ages 3, 4, and 5. <laughs> and that's, pretty, that's unprecedented in Latin America. And so, uh, but at the same time, as school is expanding for young children and also high school age students, um, uh, the quality of that schooling is becoming even more unequal. And so that's the, the current sort of dilemma in policy uh, for education improvement in Mexico. Then we also have a few chapters on transnational realities. Uh, Adam's own dissertation work was looking at how remittances improved educational attainment in rural communities in Oaxaca, and uh, others have done other work, and so we try to sort of bring those issues to bear. And then the fourth part really addresses um, assets orientations. The, the model of educación, we, purpose, we purposefully use the word educación in Spanish in the title because un niño educado is not the same as an educated child. There's something about a cultural model of educación that nurtures stronger social competence, uh, stronger family values, social assets and family assets that tend to be lost in transition, meaning lost in the cycle of acculturation. This is becoming increasingly demonstrated in uh, developmental psychology and so on. And these assets are important, not just because it's, it's nice to have children who are well adapted, but also those social competencies can be leveraged to improve academic uh, possibilities for students. Though they're often ignored in policy circles and practitioners, to them they're often is invisible because they have these sort of cultural differences. And so we present the assets or orientation really as a, as a policy and practice solution uh, in the future as we sort of um, come to terms with what is the next phase for education improvement uh, beyond no child left behind. Then lastly, uh, what, what, are, what are issues from a binational perspective that need to be addressed? And so there are a, a few programs that have been launched mostly by the Mexican government through their foreign affairs office the Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores, mm -hmm. um, but they have small budgets and little impact that we know of. And so how can we build those or scale those up in ways that address some of these uh, issues? Well, first of all, I want to thank Robert for the invitation and Eleanor and her team for the wonderful coordination and hospitality we received here. Um, it gives me pleasure to kind of go over our thesis a little bit for the book. Um, Brian and I actually met, I think it was 2007, um, in Monterrey, Mexico, at the Binational Symposium organized by Arizona State. And since that time, I can't tell you the number of conversations, long walks through streets and phone calls and meetings with great mentors like Eugene Garcia and Patricia Gandara, we really try to bring together conceptually this notion that bi binationalism matters when we consider the education of Mexican Americans here in the United States. And why does that matter? And how we've kind of come together to address this in our book, which is laid out in our introduction, is that school improvement for Mexican origin students requires enacting understandings of their binational experiences and developmental assets. Our title, Regarding Educación, when we talk about regard, we're talking about recognizing or esteeming, valuing. And as Bryant mentioned just a moment ago, we chose Educación very intentionally here. Those of us um, who know Spanish realize that Educación in Spanish encompasses a lot more than just the formal ideas of schooling as the word what it means in English. That it, also regards a, a greater life education received at homes and in communities. And so esteeming this educación means also esteeming the social competencies, such as collaboration and respect, as that empirical research more and more is showing 
exists in very high degrees um, when we look, when we study families of Mexican origin and children of Mexican origin. And also, regarding or esteeming educación also means taking into account Mexican schooling, esteeming Mexican schooling. And what are the legacies of Mexican schooling? How, are, how, are, how, is, how does teaching occur? How does family involvement occur in schools? Not only for the students themselves, but maybe also for their parents and their families. And we, we, we firmly believe that esteeming these aspects of educación are very important and often ignored when we consider um, schooling improvement. So why Mexican origin students? Um, well, we, as we know very well in a place like Los Angeles, it's a demographic imperative. One in seven students in the U.S. is now of, US, uh, is of Mexican origin. One in ten U.S. students has a Mexican-born parent. But we also know that there's a pervasive underperformance um, in, the, in the community, or as Gloria Ladson Billings might call it, an educational debt owed to um, Latino students, and especially of Mexican origin. We see intergenerational gaps in attainment. We also see intergenerational gaps in terms of achievement. And Bryant will run through some more, some of the more recent numbers that we have on this that are included in our book volume. Um, so we spoke of this demographic imperative, and I think it's important. One thing we do address in the book in our introduction is migration itself, right? And what are some basic truths about migration? Basic truths that will help correct some of the misconceptions we have about migration. Um, so these three basic truths that we've kind of brought together from the fields of sociology, mostly sociology and anthropology, is that Mexican migration is a result of economic development. It does not result from a lack thereof. Processes of urbanization, industrialization, and, and Mexico have contributed to migration. The idea of upper mobility um, in the community itself, the community of origin itself, also results in migration. Um, this idea of that going, that migrating will, uh, will increase economic well-being back at home. Um, it's also a, national, a natural consequence of broader social, political, and economic integration across international borders. Um, we all know about NAFTA, right? And NAFTA, as we know, has contributed to migration in great numbers. Um, you know, the corn crops in Mexico and, um, is, is a great um, example of how NAFTA and other, other, other processes of economic integration have contributed to the migration process. Um, it's also a process through which families tend to make U.S. their new home. Um, just talking to a, we were just talking about this, and that many, there was, for many there was this dream of eventual return to Mexico, of a short term stay. But, but more and more the, the data shows that this is a process by which families tend to make the U.S. their new home. And even with some of the recent trends towards a modest amount of return migration, it's still overwhelmingly um, a settlement, a patterns of settlement here in the U.S. Another thing we, we discuss in the book is, the histori is Mexican American students in historical retrospect. We have a section on the history, um, beginning shortly after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And so we cover this early U.S. rule in the U.S. Southwest, in which throughout the Southwest, you had many bilingual, bicultural programs. You had bilingual programs in Spanish that maintained cultural models of the home and of, of, of being Mexican. And um, while there also were some projects of Americanization during this time, there still was a much greater latitude towards bilingualism and biculturalism in the schools. And, but once you hit the period of the nativism of the World War I period, where we kind of had one of these first eras of English only, um, English only mindset, you had this kind of what we describe in the book as a dark period of subtractive Americanization and segregation. Um, Separate and unequal would apply very well to the American Southwest at this period, um, but also English only. So kind of a, a subtraction of culture and language while also a, a segregation and inequality. Um, 
the beginning of 1965, we have the civil rights era and its legacy. This is the period of the growth of bilingual education programs, Lau, Lau v. Nichols and its legacy. Um, but also that of compensatory programs that had its own deficit orientations that are important to take into account. Um, so we really would consider that period from the 1965 through the late 1990s. And then the late 1990s to the present, we have what we would call in the book the high stakes accountability English only period. I'm um, really thinking of 1998 and the UNS initiative here in California, where um, bilingual education, except in certain cases, was um, was outlawed, right? And um, and we saw that trend throughout the nation, accompanied by the high stakes accountability, and so. Bryant and I have always been optimistic by nature, right? And we really see that this period now, we consider 2011 and forward, that we have seen movements in educational policy circles towards a refinement of high stakes. Um, and we hope English only. Um, we do see a growth of certain types of dual immersion programs, for example, and successful ones. We also see waivers to No Child Left Behind as such, where there is greater flexibility towards showing count accountability. But we don't know where this is going to go. We think it's an uncertain future, but we're, opt we're optimists by nature, and we do believe that there is great hope, especially if, certain, if we start bringing certain ideas to bear in moving forward. So we have, a, I mentioned earlier, a whole sort of, you have two sort of threads of, of research um, when uh, accounting for sort of the educational well-being of Mexican origin students, as I see it. One, is sort of one that sort of identifies the assets that we'll address later, family assets, linguistic assets, uh, cultural competencies that are, that are important for sort of general well-being. You have another sort of body of literature that sort of identifies the persistent deficits uh, uh, in terms of academic performance and achievement. But rarely the two literatures speak to each other. And so that's one sort of attempt in this volume is to do that. Um, so sort of we see that and this is uh, from the chapter by uh, uh, Eddie Tellez. Um, you know, many of you, I'm guessing, will have read his uh, book with Bill Mortis on um, generations of exclusion, where they look at five generations of Mexican origin families, uh, mostly, I think, in the Los Angeles area. And they look at their attainment, accounting for socioeconomic differences and so on. And they find that even by the fourth plus generation, there's an attainment gap between uh, those of Mexican origins and non-Hispanic whites. So by attainment, again, we mean the number of years of schooling. And so we, we don't see this sort of assimilation, right, um, or this integration um, in terms of educational attainment. Uh, some sociologists are more optimistic about this or, let, or more pessimistic about this than, than others, but still the data across data sets uh, show this sort of persistent uh, gap, even by the third generation of the four plus. Um, Recently, the work by uh, Frank Bean and colleagues at UC Irvine have been able to find also in a Los Angeles sample that having an undocumented parent also contributes to lower attainment. So that they found that um, Mexican origin students whose parents never legalize or become authorized uh, migrants demonstrate two fewer years of attainment than their co-ethnic peers. This is um, in, a, in a LA sort of pot, uh, sample. Um, we don't have data on achievement for the, in this sample. We don't have sort of more representative samples. This is the best we have looking at the effects of being a, a, a child of an undocumented parent. This, this effect, by the way, persists into the third generation. So having an undocumented grandparent also bears effect, uh, effects on your attainment, though the effect shrinks by the third generation. It still persists. And so Frank Green and colleagues have dubbed that the legacy effects. We also see these gaps in terms of academic performance. So we had Claudia Galindo uh, report some of her analyses on the early childhood longitudinal study, uh, um, which is a nationally representative sample of kids who began kindergarten in 1998. They follow them through eighth grade, and in terms of their academic performance, social emotional well-being, and a host of other uh, data points. Um, so here we have the fall of kindergarten, spring of kindergarten, spring of first grade, uh, spring of third grade and spring of fifth grade. And this dotted line is the um, within SES 
non-Hispanic white mean. So we see that um, so each of these gaps are within class gaps, so that the uh, underperformance of Mexican origin students is not simply a function of socioeconomic difference. Right? It's not just about class. Right? Um, we see that uh, the third quintile, the third, the third socioeconomic quintile, demonstrates the largest gaps. Again, this gap is within socioeconomic status gaps. Uh, for those in the lowest quintile, um, we see um, this sort of closing of the gap by the spring of first grade, and even uh, Mexican origin kids who are in the lowest socioeconomic quintile do better by fifth grade than uh, poor white kids. But by and large, um, the, the, his, the Mexican white achievement gap is not simply a function of class. This is an important contribution. So um, part of justifying um, the binational approach that we um, propose in this volume is really pointing out these transnational, the transnational reality, um, our pres the present transnational reality of Mexican origin populations. And so some numbers that we share is that now 6.5% or 2.7 million children in Mexico live in households where at least one member has migrated to the U.S. in the past five years. Migration doesn't just have an impact here in the U.S., of course, it also impacts communities back, at, back in Mexico. Um, and many children are impacted by it. 25% of ninth graders in 2008 reported having at least one parent migrate to the U.S. in a student's lifetime, one-fourth. And in 2010, and this has been a growing number recently with the economic downturn here in the U.S., is that there were approximately 650,000 children in Mexican schools with U.S. experiences. Um, a population that some of our collaborators have called transnational um, children. Um, so some of the findings that we report um, in our volume around this transnational reality is that the Mexican education system is very ill-equipped to meet the cultural, linguistic, and learning needs of transnational students. Once again, these are the students who have previous schooling experiences here in the United States, but have returned to Mexico, into the Mexican educational system. A chapter by Ted Haman and Victor Zuniga um, really makes this case in point very well, that in terms of teacher training, in terms of language, culture and adaptation to curriculum, all these, all these factors are very difficult for these transnational students, as documented there. Another aspect of this transnational reality that we talk about in the book is this impact of remittances um, back in the sending community. Um, I spent a good little chunk of my graduate school writing a dissertation about this, um, some of which, which I share in the volume. And, um, Kind of one thing that I, can, I concluded looking at this in a mixed method study was that um, residency can be is related to higher school and attainment in Mexican migrant sending communities, but only for those with higher maternal education levels. Okay, so it seemed for those so it seemed to compound existing inequalities is kind of what I concluded. And, um, and, my, and some of the qualitative data I have from that study shows that the frequency of communication for those with the higher educational levels, the frequency of communication with the absent parent in the U.S., usually an absent father, but sometimes both parents, um, and a school positive message in those communications can also contribute to um, resilience in school. A third part included in our section on transnational realities is a chapter by Regina Cortina from Columbia University Teachers College. And um, she, has, she includes a study on Mexican immigrants in New York and, and really takes a binational look considering schooling pathways based upon community of origin in Mexico and even schooling modality in Mexico. And she finds that the pre-migration human capital 
of immigrant Mexican students varies greatly by state, community, and school characteristics. So whether the parents or the children themselves came from an urban school, an urban area, or a rural school, <coughs> or whether they received um, satellite schooling to the secundaria versus a more general um, secundaria or middle school training had great impact in terms of schooling trajectories. So we can't cons obviously we can't consider the community of Mexican immigrants monolithically in this sense that the place of origin, the type of schooling received factors greatly into what you might be able to predict with school trajectories. So, but to understand sort of the transnational reality of these students, that we have to know some basic facts about the Mexican system. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that the Mexican system has demonstrated sort of robust and very ambitious um, compulsory education policies. In the last year, schooling became compulsory through high school. Before that, it was uh, middle school, so ninth grade rather than twelfth grade. So that's very recent. Um, and we've seen in, in lower secondary or middle school, um, in 2000, enrollment rates were uh, about 25% of 15-year-olds nationally, and by 2010, it, it expanded about 65%. <coughs> so we saw this huge growth in, in, in access to school, and the, the school type that had the largest sort of uh, enrollment increases were these rural schools, the Tela Secundaria. These are middle schools. Now, 20% uh, of 15-year-olds are in Tela Secundaria, a, a rural school that receives much of its instruction on television in the corner of a room. That's why it's called Tele. Uh, television uh, broadcasted, and so they still have instructors in the room, and, and they'll mediate sort of the, the, the televised instruction in a way. Um, but still, we see uh, by and large that the, the performance of school uh, of students in those rural schools is much lower, and I'll, sh I'll share some of those uh, data. And so we've seen this this sort of very ambitious expan expansion of, in access at uh, the, the upper ages and the lower ages. But it has not been coupled with uh, quality improvements, especially in rural and indigenous uh, settings. And so this is, uh, part of it is just the challenges of, of resources. Um, children uh, uh, living in rural settings and indigenous settings are much more likely to live in poverty than those living in urban settings. These data probably aren't surprising. I mean, I've actually looked at data too. But, um, but then it's also demonstrated in terms of students' academic achievement. So I spent a year in Mexico um, for my dissertation using a new data set called the Excale data set, which is um, housed by um, the Instituto Nacional para la Evaluación de la Educación, which collects every year a, a, a stratified representative sample of children. Uh, one year they may do third grade, another year sixth, another year ninth. And they, they, they uh, perform sort of academic uh, achievement tests. And year after year, we see these large gaps. Um, so the mean uh, nationally in 2005 was 500, uh, standard deviation 100. So we see a full standard deviation difference, about a year and a half worth of schooling between those in urban and those in rural settings. This is sixth graders. And even lower for those in indigenous settings, about 10% of the student population and the, the, those in private schools, about 8 to 10 percent of the population, uh, do much better. So we see these trends persist. We're seeing some growth year by year, as we see. But in terms of the gaps, they, they're either persisting or growing across school types. Um, it's not just in terms of student achievement. We see the gaps also in terms of resources allotted. And so in a chapter by uh, colleagues looking at um, a, a national evaluation of preschool in Mexico, mostly with uh, five-year-olds. So the third year of preschool is equivalent to our kindergarten. Uh, they, they sort of keep them separate from the, uh, the primary or elementary school. But we see that uh, class sizes differ greatly by school type. So that if you're in a, a lower socioeconomic urban setting, uh, the largest portion, by the way, of, uh, of schools and, and children, uh, you have a higher class size than if you're in a private setting. These Konafe schools are 1% of the student population. They're the extremely rural, multi-grade schools. So <clears throat> how do we think about school improvement? So we, we've documented sort of persistent um, uh, academic and, and attainment challenges for Mexican origin kids in the US. 
uh, we're, we're seeing the growth in the trans tra transnational student population, um, and the Mexican education system is, is grappling with uh, improving school quality in the face of uh, serving more students than they ever have in, in their history. So how do we think about school improvement? We argue that in addition to other proposals that are out there, we have to be able to identify the assets, what children already bring to the classroom in terms of values, but in terms of real competencies, right? In the educational psychology literature, we think of uh, cooperation and we think of uh, responsibility and assertion and teamwork as soft skills that actually can contribute to hard skills or literacy and numeracy um, and so on. So these, these, these assets have been documented quite well in the literature. Um, Educación refers to family uh, values, uh, good manners, self-dignity, respeto. You know? Guadalupe Valdez has written about this. Uh, Angela Valenzuela has written about this. Um, we see among the first generation uh, amazing aspirations for, for children and work ethic in, uh, in, in their homes. But those don't translate into actual achievement and attainment advances. Um, and so we argue that we need to think about a, a school that embodies cultural hybridity. Um, so a chapter by uh, Cynthia Garcia Cole and colleagues uh, sort of reviews the developmental psych literature to say, okay, what are, what are some things we can say about these assets as they relate to school well-being? And we find that uh, a strong ethnic identity among Mexican-American uh, students, an identity that isn't subtractive, so they're able to sort of maintain this American while also Mexican identity is actually associated with uh, higher uh, academic attainment and higher persistence in school, um, biculturalism as well. So all of these family assets we have to be able to think of systematically, not as something separate from education, but something that's um, directly related to it. In other words, the skills that sort of the workforce is demanding now are being able to think in communities. Um, Google and Yahoo and Facebook is demanding uh, that, that uh, we, workers be able to design, evaluate, and manage their own work in, collaboratively, right? We don't have these sort of uh, hierarchical structures anymore with um, micromanagers. Just, the most productive corporations just don't function that way. Uh, we have to be able to sort of take the best from education and educación to design school activities, programs, and curricular strategies that uh, embody uh, uh, more of a hybrid model. And so, that's the argument that is made in, in, in these chapters. So, so in addition to broadening the idea of the competencies that we value in schooling, as Brian has described, we also argue in the book for kind of a reinvigoration of the binational initiatives between the U.S. and Mexico. So it's quite a long history, but it's a but it's modest in its impact for different reasons. I mean, really, since the 1970s, even, you've had efforts mostly got, that exist through the Mexican Secret Secretariat for the Exterior, through its con consulates, that has the programs for Mexicans in the abroad. The IME, Instituto para Mexicanos en el Exterior, is the main organization run through the consulates for these types of programs that are done in partnership with many different types of U.S. governmental and um, universities and other institutions. Well, in any case, we've had examples of these even since the 1970s with um, some added focus, say, in the early years of the Vicente Fox um, presidency in particular, where this embrace of, of the Mexicans in abroad living in the United States was given greater priority, at least rhetorical, um, priority. And some examples of these initiatives, as described in the chapter by Mary Martinez Wenzel, who is a graduate student at UCLA, he'll be presenting with us tomorrow over there, um, is that we've had, we have, we've had, there's a teacher exchange through this, um, exchanges that go both ways, T teachers from the U.S. who will go for experiences in Mexico to um, gain greater competencies and teaching in, in cross ways that go across culture and across language, um, kind of a bilingual, bicultural training, if you will. Um, but also teachers that will make the journey to the U.S. We 
had, of course, during the heyday of bilingual education here in California and still in Texas, you have great needs of Spanish-speaking teachers. And sometimes that need is fulfilled um, through this teacher exchange. Um, there's also a transfer document, which is basically a document that you can track a, what, if a student comes from Mexico to the United States or the other way that this document can track what has been studied, what materials, what, what grades have been covered um, so far. Um, there's a textbook donation program, mostly from Mexico to the United States, where some of the textbooks of, this, of the Secretaría de Educación Pública um, are made available here in the United States, especially for migrant ed programs. Um, the online secondary school content through the Tele Secundaria program that Brian described. Um, there's Proyecto Sol, for example, a program run by Patricia Gandara over at UCLA, um, in which this online secondary school content has been brought into um, U.S. high schools, and a dual degree has been granted um, to students through those programs. The equivalent, the bachillerato, basically, in Mexico, um, with a high school, U.S. high school degree. And there's also adult education programs. Um, there's the plazas comunitarias, which are basically um, also virtual and, and how they're run. They are um, basically ways for, um, for, for, for Mexicans living here in the United States to access resources of the education system in Mexico and continue their education in various ways. Um, but this all sounds great, right? I think we all could be for this kind of thing, but it, the budgets are very small. The scope is very small. Um, we know nothing about their effectiveness, close to nothing. Um, so limited research and evaluation, and a much more expanded agenda is needed. Um, you know, Mary and some other colleagues of our, us, ours have really just argued that this is a really about rhetoric rather than reality. It's a symbolic gestures, but not one that's backed up with a lot of money and re money and other types of of resources that would really expand it, research and development, for example. Um, but we would still argue, being the optimists that we are, that a reinvigoration of these types of initiatives could really have, could really show some gains. It would be really important. Um, so to kind of sum up, I know we've thrown a lot out here, and Brian and I think we've made progress in terms of conceptually um, putting together what we first started talking about in Monterrey in 2007 in terms of what a binational approach to Mexican-American schooling would be. Um, but maybe, we, maybe it's even more um, obtuse than ever. But this is our vision. Um, is that really acknowledging that there is a paradox, right? Um, what you described is you have this persistent and pervasive underperformance in school with Mexican origin students. Um, but the paradox being is a strong social and emotional functioning. Um, this assets literature that Brian described really are getting more and more robust evidence of this. And so it's paradoxical that, that this would exist when there's also this. And we've discussed some of those reasons. Um, so in addressing this paradox, broadening the ideas of the student competencies valued, as Brian has described, moving beyond some of these individual competencies, which tend to be the most valued, and also valuing interpersonal um, skills, collaboration, adapt adaptability, observa observation, oral communication, and intersections of this individual and interpersonal, and how they fit together. And the 21st century citizenry and a, an economy um, need these skills, right? And um, we need to move towards the future. And yes, Doc? The last, there's two more points. I mean, what happened to it? Oh, kind of fit that one. Kind of, mm. I knew there was more. <laughs> I was like, wait, that doesn't just end that way. Um, so back to what I was saying. Um, so fitting this binational, another point of our vision is fitting the binational education collaboration Within a, within a broader agenda to manage migration, um, Bryant was just in Washington last week um, pushing for this with different senators of different political parties. Um, but really, that part of managing migration, we might consider including an expansion of these binational educational programs that we have that are described in our volume. Um, 
in terms of their affordability and impact. Um, improving school quality in Mexico, especially the rural regions where we still receive so, so many of, the, of, our, of our migrants from Mexico, um, through collaborative research and development, that U.S. and Mexico could work together towards addressing the quality issue in the rural areas. Um, train and recruit teachers and other personnel to enact understandings of Mexican schooling. Um, I mean, we don't want to come across that we have a deficit ideas around what occurs in Mexican schooling. There are issues of quality that do need to be addressed in rural schools, but there also are great assets to Mexican schooling. I know in my days as a bilingual teacher and Northern and Southern California, I had students come from Mexico who were much higher in many subjects than my students in the U.S. But the point being is that an understanding of Mexican schooling and its great complexity is important for, I think, we all, all teachers who really are working with Mexican origin students here in the U.S. Um, Mexican cultural models, educación, there was um, a recent um, report from the Tomas Rivera Institute, well, I guess four years ago, if you still consider that recent, um, from Estela Sarate, who was looking at parent involvement. And she saw the values of educación are re re remarkably resilient within Latinos, generally speaking, in the US. Studying parents in California, Florida, and New York, and regardless of dominance of English or Spanish, these values of educación were resilient and robust. Um, culturally speaking, so um, it, it's something to, to regard. Language development, I mean Spanish proficiency, makes sense, right? Um, but the ideas of being able to work confidently across culture and language the same way our students do, that should be a value we also look for in our teachers. So, now ya está. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was curious, uh, you talked about at the beginning how this all stemmed from a conference in 2010. I imagine there was a lot of build up to that as well. But um, you describe as everyone at the conference and all your colleagues kind of being on the same page from Mexico and the US. And I'm curious, um, you know, what are the areas that that uh, of disagreement, or is there any alternate um, conflicting agendas between the two countries that make this more complicated? I, I, I think I was joking yesterday. Uh, I had a similar presentation at Cal State Long Beach yesterday, and I was joking afterward that we put the volume together so that the, that the um, contributors would read each other's work. <laughs> you know? um, I think I think that the the borders across disciplines are more difficult than the borders uh, across countries, actually. Um, we, I mean, there, we've covered a lot of material, and hopefully it doesn't feel like a disjointed narrative. Hopefully it feels like sort of there's a thread that connects the pieces. It was certainly our attempt. We, did it, we made our best effort. But um, you just don't have sort of policy analysts doing, uh, collaborating with folks uh, who identify social assets, for example. Like, you just don't have those disciplinary collaborations. And so my hope is that this volume can contribute to more of that, collaborations across disciplines even more than across uh, international borders, which is, uh, I think, easier, also important, but I think the interdisciplinary work is, is imperative. I mean, one in 10 kids has a Mexican-born parent in the US. I mean, it's, it's not just something that uh, those interested in Latino education sort of have the luxury of understanding. It's a, it's a demogra demographic imperative for all of us. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say there was this paradigm issue, right? We think it conceptually and um, methodologically. But I would say, um, I don't know, I found more or less agreement at the conference, but maybe one of the great challenges being, well, what's our message here? <laughs> you know, well, what's our takeaway? Um, in fact, we had a reporter from NPR who we invited down for the conference who was mad at me afterwards because he didn't have enough of a sound bite <laughs> to make a story out of it, right? Um, he needed to speak to Mr. Suro over here um, to help with that because he, Roberto Suro, did a great job um, providing an introductory message that really did tie things together quite nicely. Um, so I think that was our that was really one of our, our largest challenges. And I mean, I, I think when we um, got to the place of writing the perspectives for the book, 
we had to do a lot of work around that, and um, just the product that you see. The conference was more balanced in terms of a bidastral emphasis in the mm -hmm. book. The editors of the book really pushed us mm -hmm. to, to think about what this means for a U.S. readership, you know, because yeah. that's their audience. So, I just want to add a story, and I used to do work on this uh, decades ago. But uh, I can remember traveling between Lenox, California, Redwood City, in Northern California, Eldon, Illinois, and Houston, Texas, and commonly finding a character called Mr. Wolfie here as a as graffiti. Uh, and that's because these were both, all four of them were uh, connected community to the migration process and then connected also to Acapia in Mexico. And, you know, from just from that little study, you know, I kept, kept going and looked at you know, another community in Zacatecas, and then uh, the Compandero, and then uh, another place in Orange County, then Orange County, uh, Oxnard. And we kept, kept doing that, and pretty soon we found the, the, the interactive networks across the country, but we also found uh, hometown associations that are very popular in Mexico, beginning to appear in the United States Mm -hmm. and you can find you can find the website, but there are mm -hmm. the ones the ones in uh, in southeast their state has been about a five hundred percent increase in migration. Also, raise money for scholarships mm -hmm. to be sent to Mexico so that students there would not make the migration trip to, to the United States. So there's so if there really was a, this kind of binational pattern, but but to holding on to that, and that is not not always through settlement. Yeah, but I, I thought, you know, your, your problem yeah. is some really important thing, and the kind of binational ties that could be made between natal communities and receiving communities in the United States are very, very specific. Yeah. I can even remember a teacher in Lenox asking a teacher in Inglewood, mm -hmm. would she send some stuff home to her parents? Because she couldn't send them wow. home to her children because they didn't come from that part mm -hmm. of Mexico. So, so my understanding of the, the Mexican education system is it's much more centralized than it is yeah. in the U.S. Um, so I'm wondering what, what are the implications of that, how we're structured uh, in the United States and, and the differences in structure in Mexico, and also who chooses to become teachers, what, what's the uh, nature of, of the teaching profession in both countries? Um. I mean, it's an interesting topic. I don't know if you've been following the news in Mexico, but... Um, the arrest of the... <laughs> the arrest, right? Elba, um, Gordilla, right? Her, Gordillo. Yeah, she's also... <laughs> but anyway, um, she, was just, she was just arrested um, right after, I guess not so coincidentally, after a great reform had been passed, one of the most ambitious reforms we've seen in decades in, in Mexico. Much of it around reforming the way that um, teachers are given their um, placements um, in Mexico. Um, one that is really going to be controlled much more um, from the central government level than it was before, where the teachers union had ultimate say in who got hired and fired and where they went. And a lot of, um, a lot of these placements were actually, um, there's a lot of corruption with this where through nepotism and other types of favoritism, Certain places were reserved for certain people, right? Um, so it was one that was really run by a teachers union that had become corrupt over time, and that's been broken up all of a sudden, right? Um, Secretaria de Educación Pública will now control how teachers get hired and removed. I think there's going to be much more of an emphasis on evaluating teachers, um, trying out some of the things we're trying out here now around linking teachers to student performance, which had its own problems, right? But I think that's the idea of professionalizing the teacher profession and putting Elba in jail a couple of days afterwards for what two million dollars in charges that Neiman Marcus was a step in that direction. But yes, there was big issues um, with that in terms of how the placements occurred, and we're going to see a big change, right? I think we're going to see a real marker from this year. Yeah, the same instituto that I that I was in this new reform, the same instituto I was working with, has now been charged with. Uh, by Congress to enact these nationwide teacher evaluations, and they have 
no precedent for it. You know, they don't even want to do it. They don't know how to do it, but they're obligated to. So we'll see how that plays out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been systems like Carrera Magisterial in Mexico, which is the teacher sort of professional development program, but there's been no data to show that that program has, en has enhanced teacher quality, however measured, right? So. Um, the INE is a much more sort of free institute politically to engage in this sort of uh, effort. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, kind of these four points that you brought up, um, I study more from a higher education yeah. perspective. So I'm wondering how much does your book link these kind of four points even to like higher mm -hmm. education once education doesn't become you know, compulsory mm -hmm. but really is a choice. And particularly in the context of like in the U.S. of Hispanic-serving institutions, that, mm -hmm. where a large majority of Latino students are choosing to enroll whether two year or four year. Yeah. We had to limit our scope with this. I mean, so we really focused on pre-K to 12 here, but we did have a contribution at the conference from Stella Flores, who used work you might know, um, and she shared her work on the state Dream Acts and how much they have benefited students, um, such foreign-born immigrant. Um, students and enrollment in college. Um, so that was shared there, but certainly higher ed was not something we looked at very closely. Um, but it's extremely relevant. I mean, I think if we were to look at a binational ideas around um, migration reform, which is a little bit of our pipe dream, right? but um, higher ed would certainly need to be considered. And having some of that evidence, such as Stella's work, I think would be important to include there. In Mexico itself, I, I, I'm, I'm not in sort of the loop in terms of higher education research in Mexico, but Thomas Friedman just wrote a, an op-ed on uh, right. in, in, in the last couple of weeks on the advances of the Mexican higher education system yeah. actually in terms of enrollments and in terms of quality. It's in the last decade, two decades, there's been not only an expansion of private institutions, the largest of which is the Tec de Monterrey, which has mm -hmm. sites now across the country, but also public institutions in terms of uh, commitments from Congress and state budgets and so on. So there, you know, there's been uh, quite rapid transformations in higher education in Mexico that's worth looking at. Yeah, and UNAM is still considered a great public institution and it's still relatively, basically free. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Students made sure of that, right? Um, our UC students didn't stand up in quite the same way until recently, but yeah. Um, I think the first point you made uh, of the last points that you made right now um, was the paradox between the achievements, mm -hmm. like low achievement in school, yet um, you mentioned something about like a, a strong sense of personal identity and community, and how um, you feel like it's a disconnect. Yet from personal experience and growing up in a Hispanic community, um, I would argue that within the community it doesn't seem as a paradox because oftentimes to be part of your community means not necessarily um, School is, is, a, is like a separate realm, and so for example, in my husband's family, um, a lot of them haven't gone on to higher education, they just stay at the high school level, or didn't finish high school, but they stayed working within their family's businesses. Um, they have like a body shop, a lot of people in, in their family work at the body shop, um, they have a construction um, company going, and like a lot of the family members work in that, and so they're still regarded as people that are Educados, not educated, but educados, like you were yep. saying, because yep. they have good manners, yep. they vote, they, um, you know, they're stormers in the community, they keep their neighborhoods clean, mm -hmm. and so that's regarded as, like, being good citizens, and it has nothing to do whether or not they graduate high school. Right. And so, um, within that mindset, it's not a paradox, because, um, like my father-in-law says, like, why does it matter that I didn't go to school? If I'm successful, I provide for my family, I make sure my, my kids are good people, like, you know, they know their manners, they have good social skills, and so exactly what you're saying, like, that's a different way of seeing education versus just the academics. Yeah, I guess I can speak to that. I, the, I think the, the reason it's called identified as paradoxical, mm -hmm. um, Cynthia Garcia Cole has a recent book called The Immigrant Paradox, which talks about the developmental, the paradoxical nature of child development within Mexican origin families. And it's paradoxical because in the, in the population at large, these things tend to go hand in hand. Um, social emotional competence and uh, cognitive development <laughs> tend to go in the normative population hand in hand. And so it's paradoxical because we see it, a huge gap within especially the children of Latino immigrants or first generation immigrant children themselves where they have, we have a strong social emotional competence 
consistent in many ways with the middle class population, but low cognitive performance. So it's par paradoxical when it's compared to the population at large. You know, not to say that it's paradoxical to oh. families living it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So it's more of an academic paradox. Yeah. You also have the issue of two different, different kinds of middle class. You have a, a yeah. middle class that's risen entrepreneurially. It's, you know, to businesses who still have obligations to working class parents or kin, and who have achieved a middle class income to the expansion of businesses, and therefore the ideology of going on to college just isn't there. Um, but what makes it problematic and could, could result in, in the delayed paradox is that the kinds of jobs that their children may get without, without further post-secondary education may not be there five or ten years later. And they won't, and they, they won't have the flexibility to accommodate that. So if they, yeah, they have middle class incomes, but not, not really middle class status because they still have the obligations. And then there's Jody work, Jody uh, Vallejo's work, you know, pointing out that the, the middle class that's, that's achieved middle class uh, mobility through uh, higher education, they, they they may be more competitive and more familial, but well, they'll not be a social activist uh, only to the extent that it doesn't harm their own families, I guess. And I, I assume that the dreamers are going to get yet yet, yet another uh, type of middle class who, who's, well, group that does experience education, but is, but is going to identify themselves as American first. Mm. Oh, okay. And then Latino, you know, because this is the only country that we're raised yeah, in, so they won't have the binational time. Sense, and then make, but Mexico, I think, should invest in them if you still want to continue remittances to Mexico. <laughs> right. And they should give scholarships to them, you know, yeah. so that they grow up with a memory of the, uh, you know, that Mexico did contribute to their well-being here. So that I think Mexico has a should make a real investment in the in the education of uh, expatriates, for lack of a better term. I know we're uh, we're at about one o'clock, okay. so which is what we promised for the free part. They'll charge you for consultation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank the school for uh, for sponsoring uh, Brian and yes. Adam. Um, we do have a couple of other. Um, if you want to remind people again about upcoming, yes, yes. I'm um, sure uh, both of these guys will be willing to hang around and answer yeah. any questions we have. Thank you. On uh, Thursday, April 4th, we have Dr. Kalina Cortez speaking about the Dream Act and the effect of the IC IRCA on immigrant youth post-secondary educational access. That's here in this room. And then on May 1st, we have Dr. Sarah Goldrick Rabb, who's speaking about need based financial aid and college persistence. Um, please come and please spread the word. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.